One, two, one, two, set, play. So the first thing I want to do is um, show you kind of my logic for coming up with these fingerings for the head. When I'm uh, looking and searching for fingerings to play music with, I always try to find the most legato fingering. In other words, what's the fingering that will let me play the notes the most connected? Things I like to avoid um, when playing that way. So I don't want to shift with one finger more than once. And most of the time I don't want to shift more than one fret unless I really have to, you know, make a count. Um, look at the first uh, couple measures. I have uh... notice that slide from that B to that C natural. Uh, even though it's a slide, the second note is still picked. All that slide was was to uh, get me set up for the next three notes. Same thing with the next measure. Also, just like that first measure, notice uh, that hammer on on that third to fourth note there. Right there. That F sharp to the G. Fourth measure. And once again, uh, you don't have to, uh, uh, you need to pick that uh, note. Notice the rooftop accents there on uh, measure uh, six. I played them short. Short, short. And then I uh, go into the next measure. There in um, uh, measure seven and eight. Notice I had that little slide that was a slur. One. Really helps fit the uh, articulation there. Then this tricky fingering here in measure, uh, what is that, uh, nine. Those first four notes, I play uh, a D flat with one. Then I come down that uh, shape, that arpeggio, just like I would an A chord, but it's a B flat chord. Just another uh, word to the wise there. Um, one thing you don't want to do uh, when you're playing, trying to play legato and practice legato, is what you should do as a guitar player, try to connect all the notes, is make sure the notes don't overlap. You don't want notes on different strings ringing at the same time or it ceases to sound like a melody. See? No, you don't want that. You see that a lot with younger players. It's because their coordination is not quite uh, fine-tuned yet. So uh, be sure and practice legato and then add in the style and shorten up the notes. 
uh, but be sure not to make the notes overlap at the same time. They have to be perfectly coordinated. So maybe the most simple way to uh, start improvising is to uh, learn to just use the blues scale. You can use just the blues scale effectively. Um, if you uh, really try hard and uh, get the sound of the notes in your head, you really find that you can learn to use this material really expressively. So let's look at a uh, pattern for a uh, two octave blues scale. Take a minute and just uh, look over the uh, pattern and uh, commit the notes to memory. Uh, notice in the fingering there, I shifted from the 7th fret on that G flat up to the A flat with my first finger so I could get three notes in a row and then finish the scale. A couple um, neat things with the blues scale, a lot of players use little licks. This little turn on the um, third to the fourth note, down to the third, down to the, uh, the second note. So you hear that a lot, and then um, you hear a lot of repetition from the seventh going to the root, or like something like that, and then uh, up here. Something like that. So the best way to learn to use this blue scale is listen to like some uh, some really uh, stereotypical type of players that a lot of people listen to, like BB uh, King, Freddie King, Albert King, <laughs> Three Kings, um, Steve Ray Vaughan, you know, Jimi Hendrix. Those types of players that really use the blues scale in its um, pure form quite a lot. Obviously, as you get more advanced and you become a better player, you'll want to use more um, material than just the blues scale. I'll have a whole video about um, improvisation on the blues for young musicians. That'll fit all the instruments and not just the guitar. So stay tuned for that one and uh, be sure that you look at that. That'll really help out. But for now, it's good just to uh, try to communicate using one scale until it sounds effective. Because it can be effective if uh, you know the notes and you listen to it enough and uh, mimic uh, the sounds that you hear. One thing I would recommend is um, just try to copy um, some licks that I play. So I'm going to play like um, a little 3-4 note lick and then you play it back. So what's, what's called trading uh, licks. So... A one, two, three, four. Your turn. Two, three, four. And here's it again. Three, four. Find it again. Ready, go. So if you did it, you found that I used that E flat, D flat, and B flat. Just a three note lick. Now try something like this. One, two, ready, go. Here it is again. Two, three, four. So there all I did was use two notes on the blues scale, E flat and G flat. What you want to do is you want to find a friend and you want to come up with little short ideas or motives uh, from this blues scale and play them back and forth in time and see if your friend can figure it out, just like we did. So find a friend and... Um, Trade licks on the blue scale. It's the quickest way to build some uh, fluidity in your playing with the blue scale. So a lot of times when I work with guitar players, um, we're trying to talk about uh, ways to uh, read their rhythm changes and the chords better on the page. Um, at first, I like to advocate to keep uh, quarter note time with particular voicings uh, called like Freddie Green style. And what you do with that is you uh, have these uh, few voicings I'll show you. So uh, you can have, uh, you know, majority of the, the seven chords you're going to play on the jazz guitar. You're going to see this major seven type shape. So you have a root, a third, and a major seven. You have this dominant seven shape. Root, third, and a dominant seven. Notice if it's just one note different. You have a minor seven shape. And 
notice this minor 7 shape doesn't have a 5th in it. So if you did see like a chord like minor 7 flat 5, it could be safe to go ahead and use this one as well. And then finally we have this shape, which could be a lot of things. It could be like a part of an E flat diminished chord. It could be like E flat minor 6. So it takes care of a couple things there. Also, if you wanted to use the root note on the low E string, you could use these shapes. So there's a major 7. Now we have the root, the 7th, and then the 3rd. Then a dominant 7 shape. Root 7 and 3rd. Notice it's just one note different. Minor 7 shape. And then finally we have that shape that can be used as a diminished shape or a, a minor 6 chord. So in between those four voicings, you can do a lot of damage if you know where all your root notes on your low E string and your low A string are, you have just a plethora of chords uh, under your belt now. Um, also, by having uh, two shapes, one where the root's on the low E string and one where the root's on the A string, you don't always have to move up and down the neck as far. You can shift over and toggle the roots between the E and the A string. So look at um, this example from the bridge from uh, this web bass blues. You'll notice I use that very thing uh, when I'm doing that. So I got these uh, this bridge starting first here with the uh, low E string has the root. And it uh, looks like this. One, two, three, four. E flat. E flat minor seven. E flat seven. A flat seven. F seven. Notice that last chord is a B flat uh, seven with a sharp nine. Really crunchy chord there. Alternatively, um, you could use um, this one that starts on the A string. One, two, So for the next part of the lesson, you need to know uh, what these drop two voicing chords are. Um, they can be played with the thumb and the fingers or with the pick, but it's nice because they're on adjacent strings. They feel real comfortable, and I like to play them with my thumb and fingers because, um, you know, you can control the length of the notes really precisely like that, like almost like a piano can play. makes it more percussive and uh, more um, usable. Because when you go through it with a pick, you know, I think it's this draggy kind of sound. You always feel like you're behind. It's a little harder to do to make sound really clean, at especially really high tempos. So what is a drop two chord? A drop two chord um, would be, um, you know, a chord like this C7 here. It's in what you call um, closed position because each note in the seven chord is close to each other. We have the root, the third, the fifth, and the seventh. So this is kind of a uh, stretch for some players. Uh, so if somebody got the bright idea, what they would do is they would take the second to highest note, drop it down an octave, and then just refinger the other notes into a new voicing. That's what you call a drop two voicing because they took the second to highest note, took it down an octave, then they just kicked all the other notes maybe in a new fingering. So what you can do is you can learn all these drop two shapes with different um, inversions. So let's go through some of those right now. So first we're going to play our E flat uh, major seven drop two voicings. E flat major seven. Here's E flat major seven with a G in the bass. So that's first inversion. E flat major seven with a uh, B flat in the bass. That's second inversion. And E flat major seven the seventh in the bass. It's kind of an odd sound, but it's useful nonetheless. Then on the D string, we can have uh, the root there, E flat major seven, with a uh, root inversion. Then we can have E flat major seven in first inversion, with a G in the bass. Have the E flat major seven with the B flat in the bass again, up an octave. That's uh, second inversion, and then third inversion, finally, with the seventh in the bass. 
So what you want to do when you play through those is uh, memorize their shapes and also know where the E flat is in the four notes of the chord. So that first one that we saw, uh, E flat's in the low string. Then notice when you go up an inversion, the E flat is on the uh, uh, G string, and then it's on the D string, and then finally it's on the uh, the the high string there, the B string. And you'll want to do that with the other four shapes as well. So you can also turn any of those shapes by changing one note into E flat dominant seven or E flat seven shapes. So notice in all these shapes, everywhere where the, there was a seven, a major seven, the D is now a D flat. So there's the first one. Here's the next one. And the next one. And then the next one. Here they are on the uh, D string root. First inverted. Second inversion. And then third inversion. So now that we've made dominant seven chords, what you can do is you can change the third, the G in all those notes, to G flat, and get E flat minor seven. So here's some of these shapes. E flat minor seven. That one's kind of tough. Got to stretch between the second and third finger on that first inversion there. And you have the second inversion, and then finally the third inversion. And D flats in the bass. That's seventh. Now, on the uh, high string, we have root inversion or root position. It's not an inversion yet. <laughs> First inversion, second, and then this bar straight across on 11, with the sevens in the bass. It's a real popular version of that. So now that we have minor seven chords, we can flat all the B flats to B double flat, the fifth of the chord, and get minor seven flat five uh, chords. Minor seven flat five chords are also called half diminished chords. You hear them used interchangeably. Um, so the half diminished symbol is like a superscript degree sign with a slash through it. You'll know it when you see it. So here's uh, E flat, half diminished, or E flat, minor seven flat fives. It's my favorite chord. Minor seven flat five, then you have it on the uh, D string. Just amazing to think there's so many ways to play these chords and there's a systematic way to figure them out. And finally, from the E flat uh, half diminished chord, if we flat all the sevenths again, we get what's called a diminished seventh. And what's cool about these shapes is they all look the same. Diminished seventh chord has nothing but minor thirds essentially in the uh, structure. So each one of these chord shapes, once you find a different uh, find them on a different string, they all look the same. So you have E flat diminish, G flat diminish, B double flat diminish, and then finally uh, D double flat diminish. My sorry. All right, then on the uh, e, on the D string there is it's a really nice one to move up and down in minor thirds really quickly because it doesn't change shape. So there you go. There are some uh, drop two voicings. Remember, the important thing is that you can find the root note in each inversion. You know what the or the E flat example in, in those chords, for example, the E flat is. So that way you can find and locate those when you need them. Another common question from students once they learn these um, drop two voicings is, well, these are great for seven chords, but what do you do about nine chords? So um, there's what you call chord substitutions. And what we can do is we can take a, um, a like a third. So if we have um, a C uh, major seven drop two voicing, for instance, if we started that on an A, now all of a sudden the root note is an A. It's an A um, minor nine chord. So when, in other words, whenever you have a minor nine chord, 
just go to the third of that chord and play major seven. And it's always a minor nine. And if I played another major seven somewhere, I could do the same. So C major seven with an A in the bass. There it is again. I mean, anywhere that you can play a C major seven, and you put an A in the bass, you'll get an A minor nine. I mean, you could do that, you know, in any key, you know. So if you had um, F minor nine, what's the third of F minor? It's A flat. So play A flat major seven. When you put the F in the bass, then it sounds like the, uh, um, F, the F minor 9 that you wanted. That's the good thing about playing guitar is you don't have to play the bass note all the time. That's the bass player's job, especially when you're dealing with, you know, five, six, sometimes seven note chords. Uh, you don't have room to play, but just really three and four notes that you can play and move around in an agile, functional kind of way. Next example, we'll see a, another version of um, something we can do with this uh, minor 7 uh, chord inversion. So it says A minor 7, or is it C6? So, in other words, anytime you see a, um, a 6, a major, you know, a major chord with an added 6, just go down a minor 3rd and play a minor 7 chord and you'll get it. So let's try it somewhere else. Let's try... Um, E flat major six. So what's a minor third down from E flat? C. So we'll play C uh, minor seven. You put an E flat in the bass. Now it's a C major six. Another one that I like real, uh, a whole lot is um, this one that you can do with that minor seven flat five chord. You know, is this uh, B minor seven flat five or is it G? Nine. So, you know, we can do that anytime. We'll have if we need a nine chord, go up to the third of the chord, then play minor seven flat five. Uh, let's try, I don't know, D. So we want D um, nine. So let's go to the third of the D nine chord, which is F sharp. So let's play F sharp minor seven flat five. The D in the bass. There you go. Now if we played that uh, Right here, we could do the same thing. Go D in the bass. There you go. You get the same result. Works like clockwork. Perhaps the most useful one, though, is this one off the Floyd of Minor 7 chord. Is it Floyd of Minor 7 chord or is it a 7 flat 9 chord? You find that a lot. This is really useful because those diminished shapes are everywhere. The good news about that chord, you don't have to think about the third. Um, think about. Um, you can start on any note of that 7 flat 9 chord, except for the root, and play a diminished 7th chord, and you'll get the same result. So, for instance, if we're trying to find G 7 flat 9 chord, the notes are G, B, D, F, and A flat. So you can start on B, B diminished, D diminished, F diminished, or A flat diminished, and all get that chord in a more usable kind of way. So those are the uh, explanations for just a few of the chord subs. There's tons of other chord subs. You could I could devote, you know, an hour to teaching you stuff about this. So uh, be resourceful and look up some more on your own. And finally, um, I can show you how to use this drop two strategy over the bridge and then the last twelve bars of the tune, as opposed to just uh, going straight to the Freddie Green style. Notice I'm also going to use a uh, Charleston rhythm in these examples. The rhythm is one. Then the and a two, so it sounds like one, two, and, one, and. Here's the bridge. There we go. So one, two, oh, one, two, three, four. Finally, we can look at the chorus the same way. One, two, oh, one, two, three, four.
Also, if that Charleston rhythm gets a bit uh, monotonous, you can mix it up. So instead of playing on one and the and of two, you can shift everything over an eighth note and play on the and of one and beat three like this. One, two, three, four. Or you can put over two and then the and of three. One, two, three, four, one, two. Or you can mix it up. One, two, three, four. Finally, be sure and uh, learn all these drop two voicings and uh, all the inversions for each chord and try to come up with really smooth ways to connect the chords on your own other than the ones that I wrote up for you. That's the key is to work with this material on your own until you can become uh, fluent with it and just be creative on the fly.